Please open your Bibles to, to Daniel chapter 5. Uh, we are going back into Daniel. Last week we talked about the uh, Christmas traditions. Charlie tells me that uh, YouTube, there was more, more hits for that one than even our Daniel study, which you have quite a few for. So I guess obviously there's a lot of people who want to know what the traditions of Christmas are about. And we did it last week. But tonight we're going back to Daniel chapter 5. And I'll review a little bit. We only went, we only went through the first nine verses. But every now and then there's a Bible study that comes up that it takes you a certain way. And then it shows you something that's pretty important, really important, really fundamentally important. And tonight is going to be that type of Bible study. Uh, tonight I'm going to actually, and uh, you know, I wish I could have pronounced this to everybody and just let everybody uh, hear what's going to happen. But tonight... Uh, through this Bible study, we're going to find out the reason why we are here. Now, it may sound simple to you, it may sound profound, I don't know, but there's a reason why every single one of us were created, and it's kind of amazed you uh, when you see it, how it's put together, and how really the Lord opened it up to me as I studied it this week. So open with me to Daniel chapter 5. We're going to go to verse 10, but I'm going to give you a little review uh, because we missed a week. So, okay, the suspense novel continues tonight, and if Daniel is anything, it's a, su a suspense novel. And let me bring you up to speed. We're in Daniel chapter 5. Nebuchadnezzar the king is dead. His personal testimony can be found in Daniel chapter 4. If you remember chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar had his seesaw battles up and down with Daniel's God. And basically he was a very, very powerful king. He was, a very, he was an egomaniac. And basically he realized, a megalomaniac. And uh, Daniel, he would be confronted with Daniel's, Daniel's God. And he would have these moments back and forth where he would believe Daniel's God because he'd see the miraculous things he did. But then by the, end of the, by the end of Daniel chapter 4, what we see is he is humbled by this dream and uh, goes insane. He has a lycanthropy, which is a symptom that you would call werewolf symptom. Not that he became a werewolf, but he thought he was a wolf. He thought he was an animal. He was on his all fours for seven years. His mind comes back to him. And Daniel chapter 4 is actually his personal testimony. Nothing is left of Babylon. We can't find only, we can only find the ruins of this great kingdom, but we can find Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, personal testimony in Daniel chapter 4. So De Nebuchadnezzar is dead. His personal testimony can be found in chapter 4 of Daniel. And Nabonidus, his son, is in power over Babylon. It's an unbelievable city. We've shown you some of the pictures of it. Pictures can't do it justice. It would take your breath away if you could see Babylon, an amazing city. I, if, I could, if I could describe it to you tonight, it would take me at least four hours to describe Babylon. Babylon in detail with all the archaeological remains we've seen. Uh, we can only imagine what this was like. So Nebuchadnezzar has his own bouts with his gods. All of these people have their bouts with gods. He's a worshiper of the moon god. He, uh, he, and he's also a believer a little bit in Daniel's God, back and forth, similar to his father. And uh, he goes for a four-year journey to Taimya, Taimya in Saudi Arabia, to, which is a shrine to the moon god. He hears of wars coming. The wars are happening with the Medes and the Persians. They're making their mount from north, and they're coming down, they're sweeping, and Babylon is it's in, a, in its descendancy. Babylon is a kingdom that is going down. It's in its, its best years behind it, even though it has a formidable city that's impregnable, can't be, uh, can't be uh, broken. The walls are tremendously thick. It's the most formidable city of the time of ever, probably. And so it's pretty much secure anybody in Babylon, but when, uh, when Nabonidus goes to meet Cyrus the Great in the northern spots with his Persian army, and he takes there, he flees from Cyrus. He puts his son, Belshazzar, as the commander and as a king, if you will, in Babylon. So he is taking, he is, uh, he's in command of Babylon while, he, while, while uh, Nabonidus, his father, travels north of his army to meet King Cyrus, king of the Medes and the Persians, who are challenging the rural leadership of Persia and Babylon, its capital. Nabonidus, Again, flees in defeat from Cyrus, at which time Cyrus marches his army directly outside the seemingly impregnable city of Babylon. Now, if you haven't done it before, do it now. In Daniel chapter 5, in your margin, write in your Bible, this date. It is October 11th, 539 B.C. We know historically the exact day of Daniel chapter 5. That's pretty amazing to me. I, I don't know. I still get amazed every time I think about it. it in the, in the, it's in the evening hours of October 11th, 539 B.C. Belshazzar is throwing a massive licentious religious party. 
He is doing it, no doubt. Runners have come and told him that his father has fled. No doubt it's his time to shine in, the, in his father's kingdom because he's behind an ironclad wall of Babylon. Babylon has reserved its troops. We know from the Nabonidus scroll, they've reserved their troops. They have an army in and around Babylon and they're waiting for the Persians to come believing that they can defeat them. So he's throwing this licentious party in the great banquet hall of his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Boy, don't you love Bible, in-depth Bible study? This isn't something just thrown together just out of a drawer someplace. How many understand that? So he's having this massive Bible, he's massive Bible study. He's having this massive banquet. We're having the Bible study. He's having this massive banquet in this, and he's, he's invited everyone from all over the province to come in to make them feel not just secure, but to make them praise their gods, their false gods, on the victory they're going to have, presumption, because he believes that he is going to shine because he's behind this impregnable city. So, full of pride, he rests in the seemingly impregnable defenses of mighty Babylon as the hordes of the Medes and the Persian warriors camp outside the city. Daniel is nowhere to be found. He is living in obscurity. Belshazzar, there's no record or, or indication that Belshazzar even knows Daniel. There'll be a slight understanding of that later on. He'll say something he's heard. But he is not looking to Daniel for any advice to his, to his downfall. He is, uh, Daniel is not needed. He is, after Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel obviously goes in descendancy himself. And he is somewhere living in obscurity in Babylon. He's living in the city. And by the way, at this time, it is believed, and get this. Now remember how long ago this was. It's to believe that this city has two million inhabitants. So it is a massive city. It is huge. It would be a mega city even today. And so he's living somewhere among those people, forgotten by the courts, forgotten by anybody in power. Belshazzar, in the middle of this drunken orgy, commands, he knows the history, he knows his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar has sacked Jerusalem, has taken the temple treasures, among which are the goblets that were used to sacrifice oblations to Jehovah. And it's part of the treasury that was taken from, ba from Judah to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather. He commands that those vessels, Nebuchadnezzar never touched those, Nabonidus never touched those, he commands that those treasured vessels, those drinking vessels be taken out so he can get drunk with them to his false gods. This is his presumption. This is his pride. And so basically look at Daniel chapter 5 verse 3 as we give you, give you a little bit more of an update on it. Then he brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of Jer God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. Not only he gave it to everyone. I told you last week that there's a word, or actually it was the week before, maybe it was last week. There's a word that we use called vulgar. That word vulgar, we, have to, we, think it's, uh, we think a different thing of it. The actual word vulgar means this, common. It means taking something that's given to kings and making it common. So he, uses, he makes these vessels vulgar by trying to do this. It's a, vulgar pro, uh, it's a vulgar act because it's making them common. So, and in unholy defiance to the God of Daniel, they get drunk with them. Look at verse 4. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. The things that they made, the things that they have. Then it happens. Daniel 5.5. 5. In the same hour came forth fing fingers of a man's hand and rolled over, over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. Look at that palace. Somewhere on that palace wall. And by the way, this is, a, this is an artist's reconstruction of the ruins of that, of that hall. So it's probably that size. It was that size. Uh, and says, uh, plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the hand, king saw the part of the hand that wrote, a disembodied hand comes and writes, and I'm not thinking it's a small hand, this is probably huge. It writes something on this wall, and something happens to Belshazzar, his response of one in fear and trepidation. Look at verses 6 to 9. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loose. That's a euphemism, it means he went to the bathroom, and his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to the bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, soothsayers, you remember them from chapter 2. The king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof, for his grandfather was whosoever should show me this dream and tell me the interpretation of it. This one is whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation of it. Um, shall therefore be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And so look at verse 8. Then came in all the king's wise men, they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. It was cryptic. Something about this writing, and I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show you what I believe it was. Two, two things that it could have been. It's cryptic. They, they can't read it. They can't interpret it, and they can't read it. So listen to what it says in verse 9. 
Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. So, which brings me up to date of where we're going to go tonight. Tonight is part two of our outline. Uh, by the way, the king sees this, sees a writing on the wall that may have looked something like this. Uh, it was definitely in Hebrew, by the way. Uh, we don't know. Some people think they don't know what, what it was in. It was probably in Hebrew. I'll tell you why as we continue a little bit further. I hid that from you. He sees it. He's very, very fearful of it. And uh, basically what happens, it brings us right here. Uh, Daniel chapter 5 is, I am a God, and I approve of this message. Remember that? <laughs> the writing on the wall, moving of fingers, which we've already done. And now tonight, the weighing the balances. Daniel chapter 5, verses 10 through 31. Let me give you a quick a uh, quick outline just so I don't go rabbit chasing tonight and show you where we're going. Here's what we're going to talk about. The queen mother. You're going to find out who she is and what she has to say. Then we're going to talk about her ignorance and her insight. Daniel. Three people. It's good. The rest of this chapter involves three people. Daniel. Daniel's re reward. That's a w, extra W there. Daniel's refusal. Daniel's rebuke. Daniel's revelation. And Daniel's robing. And then we're going to talk about Darius, the slayer of the king and the silver chest reigns. If you remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream, head of gold, silver chest. So let's jump in right away. The queen mother. She is the grandmother of Belshazzar. She's the queen mother. Her name was Nitocris, as we know it from, uh, from history. She is the wife of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is dead, but she's still alive. Now, it's quite feasible that Nebuchadnezzar died in his 80s. He would not marry anyone his same age. He would probably marry someone very, very young. This woman is probably in her 60s, maybe even maybe early 70s. She is the queen mother. She's still revered in Babylon. Although the kingship has gone beyond her, she is still part of the royal family. Look at her ignorance, verse 10. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house. That tells me she's not in the feast. She's not celebrating this orgiastic feast. She comes into the banquet hall because she hears the king is having some problems. And, uh, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. She sees something's wrong with her. her, her basically, her entire, the entire palace had heard about the commotion in the banquet hall. And the news obviously reached the queen mother. She went to offer her advice to co and comfort to Belshazzar, her grandson. The first thing she said seems to be a bit pointless. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. Basically, what she's really saying was, don't panic. Everything's going to be okay. That's the wisdom of age. Age gives us wisdom. When you're young and foolish and things happen, you, go, you get thrown off for a loop. When you get a little bit older, it doesn't really matter anymore. How many know that? Because you've seen a lot of things. So age teaches you something. She realizes, yes, this is terrible. And yes, you think it's horrible, and it probably is. But we've seen these type of things before. Look at her insight, verse, verse 11. She says, there is a man in the kingdom. Oh, I love this. In whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, that's his grandfather, by the way. That father is used there as his uh, ancestor. Light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, uh, the king, I say, thy father, it means his grandfather, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. So here comes this woman. Her attitude doesn't match the seriousness of the situation, obviously, but her suggestion was a good one. Find Daniel. You would be wise to find this guy that you could care less about your whole life. I've seen him do some things that are pretty amazing, and I've seen him <laughs> tap into what he, she calls the God's wisdom. And she says, your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, who, by the way, was the king of the greatest empire ever on planet Earth, he would, would, revert, would revert to him in telling him things. So no doubt, as Nebuchadnezzar's wife, she saw firsthand the counsel and godly advice Daniel gave when he was called upon. He was the king's greatest advisor. Here's the problem with youth. You think that they have a better way. <laughs> you did when you were young. You think that their way is definitely the better way. It takes them age to find out that they better tap into some of the older people because they really have seen everything and they know everything. Come on, somebody say amen. You know, the older I got, to people who say this all the time, the older I got, the wiser my father got. <laughs> this is what's happening. She taps into something and she sees something and she knows something that Belshazzar doesn't know. How sad that then that Belshazzar did not think of Daniel. How sad that he had no communication with him, no touch with him. It would appear that he didn't even know Daniel and who he was. 
the highest official in the kingdom, the wisest counselor in the empire, and he had been forgotten. According to verse 22, Belshazzar had heard of his grandfather's dream. And now Dan Daniel had interpreted it, but obviously it's some distant thing to him. Look at verse 12. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, showing of hard sentences, and dissolving of doubts. I love that one. Dissolving of doubts. That, that right there speaks volumes. Not only can he interpret dreams, not only can he write this, read this right handwriting, he's going to take away all your doubts. He's going to tell you exactly what this means. And he goes on, we're found in the same Daniel whom the king named Belsha Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he'll show the interpretation. I could just see the, the, the mad rush to find out where Daniel lived. Probably nobody knows where he lives there. There's probably a decree. We're not told, but there's probably a decree that goes out. Find Daniel. Search high and low. Knock on every door. Find out where this man is. By the way, it's a big risk. Because Daniel's well into his 80s right now, whether he's alive or not. He's over about 82 years old right now. And whether he's alive or not, they don't know because he's been in obscurity for so long. So the queen's description of Daniel shows that his testimony didn't go unnoticed. Uh, God had used this man to bring knowledge and understanding and interpretation of dreams. And now he would be called upon again. Listen, let me put a footnote here. There may be people around you in your job, maybe even unsaved family members that think you're just, you don't know what you're talking about when you talk about God. Maybe they think you're just, you're too, you're too religious or they think that you're too superstitious maybe even. Or maybe they think that you're believing in a God that's, that's just not up to date. And they may, they may push you to the side until they have some serious doubts. And when they have some serious doubts and nobody in the world can help them with their doubts, you know who they're going to, find, who they're going to search out? They're going to search you out, who have an understanding of God. This is what happens. It's man's, it's man's short-sightedness, but it's also our testimony that we are there uh, for those times. Then we see Daniel. If Daniel was 16 when he was taken to Babylon in 605 B.C., and Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians in 539 B.C., that's history, then he's 82 years old when Belshazzar summons him to the banqueting hall. Wow, 80 two years old. So many times in Scripture you see God use people that we would consider past it or beyond it in age. However, true servants of the Lord never abandon their ministries. You don't ever retire. That's no such thing as being retiring from being a Christian. Somebody said to me the other day, they said, uh, oh, I heard that you retired from pastoring. I said, listen, I am not retired. I'm doing more now than I've ever done. I, I resigned to pastor it, but I am still pastoring. I'm still marrying people. I'm still burying people. I'm still teaching. I'm still preaching. Listen, as a Christian, you can never retire from being a Christian. Come on. So basically, 2 Timothy, look what 2 Timothy says. It's kind of neat. It says this, and it doesn't give you an age limit on it, by the way. It says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I was doing a... Uh, uh, an interview process years ago for some people to go on our board and they were putting their names up and this one man who was in his 80s said to me, I, I just, I'm too old. I can't do it. He says, he says I, nobody wants me around. I said, that's exactly why I want you on this board. I want you on this board because there's young people here that think they can do it and they know what they're doing and they don't know, they don't have a clue and I want you on this board. And he was one of the most invaluable board members I had because he had seen it all. He knew, it, he knew the ups and downs. His wisdom was amazing and we miss so much when we don't tap into that mis wisdom of the elderly. Look at Daniel's reward, verse, uh, verse 13 to 16. And I'm going quickly in here because I want to show you something as we go further. Then was Daniel brought be in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah? He didn't know him. Whom the king, my father, uh, ancestor, brought out of Jewry, or, you know, out of Judah. I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee. It's probably from, it, from the queen mother. And that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read the writing and make known to me the interpretation of. But they could not show the interpretation of the thing. I'm sure Daniel went, blah, 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 blah. I heard all this before. Your grandfather said the exact same thing to me. You're not telling me anything new. It may be new to you. It's not new to me. Verse 16. And I have heard of thee, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now, if you can write, read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, you'll be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about your neck, and shall be third ruler in the kingdom. And Daniel says, oh, good. If you're going to give me things, then I'm going to do it. <laughs> oh, if you're going to pay me? That's a different story. No, Daniel has integrity. It doesn't matter whether the king gives him anything or not, as you'll see. You can just picture the scene. Daniel walks into the banqueting hall and casts a glaring eye at the tables, strewn with food, the floor strewn with drunks, and the walls strewn with the dead, the deaf, and the dumb idols of Babylon. Man, how things had changed over the years that he had been there. 
Then he spots something on the floor. There lying amongst the debris of the evening shenanigans is a harlot. And what is it in her hand? It is. Could it be? It, it is. It's one of the sacred vessels from the temple of the living God. Now, we're not told that, but I can just imagine that. You can imagine how, how atrocious a sight it was for Daniel. He knew those temple vessels, by the way. He knew what they looked like. He had, been seen, he had seen them since he was a boy. And uh, he knew when he was back in Judah what they looked like in the temple. And he sees them in this banqueting hall. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know about me, but I would think that Daniel would go into a tirade and start rebuking everything on the planet. He doesn't. Now watch. Then Daniel sees the message on the wall. There are the glowing letters written in with God's own hand. Could Daniel really read what was on the wall? Of course he could. He'd been reading God's word all through his life, all for almost 80 years. By the way, it was probably Torah Hebrew. Hebrew. God probably did it purposely so that Daniel was the only one that can interpret it. It's Hebrew. Hebrew, if you remember, uh, why wouldn't they know Hebrew? Because remember when Nebuchadnezzar took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel over? He taught them the Chaldean language. How many remember that? You've got to put your Bibles together. You've got to put your Bible verses together. If he taught them the, the Chaldean languages for him to assimilate them into their society, and Hebrew was a forgotten language. They were killing the language. It was not read. It was forbidden to be read. It was not read. It was nowhere around. So God probably wrote in Hebrew their distinct letters. I'm sure the Chaldeans had seen the Hebrew letters somewhere down the line, but none of them could read it because none of them were ever taught to read it. Only Daniel could read this or any Hebrew that could be there. So you can get the picture. It was not a new situation for Daniel being. He'd been here once or twice before. A revelation from God, a fearful and frustrated ruler, incom incompetent counselors, and God's servant to the rescue. And that sounds something like a scenario I'd like to see happen in America, wouldn't you? God's servant to the rescue. He paid little attention to the king's flattering speech, but he certainly had no use for the king's generous offer. It occurred to me when I was reading this and studying this that that's similar to what happened in America. In America... In Congress, there was actually a pastor to Congress. I have a friend whose name is Peter Marshall. Peter Marshall wrote a couple of books. He's a great historian. He wrote From Sea to Shining Sea. His father was the chaplain for the United States, the United States Congress. Uh, presidents would call him in for advice. Uh, there was a time in America when presidents would call in theologians. I'm not talking about people they handpicked. I'm talking about people that rose in the theological venue in America. And they'd call them in. Billy Graham was one of them. Billy Graham counseled lots of presidents. You'd no longer have that in America. It's almost like the Daniels that were there in America are now gone. They're out in the, they're out in the wayside someplace. I promise you, America's going to need to call a Daniel very soon. I promise you, this is very, very similar to what we're going through. Let me give you what Daniel says, and I love this, verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts. I love that. Let thy gifts be to thyself. I don't want anything you have for me. I love this. And give the rewards to another. He says, you take whatever you want to give to me, give them to somebody else. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Listen, a real man of God cannot be bought. Somebody once said, everybody has their price. No, there are some people who actually don't have their price. I don't have my price. I'm not going to compromise my stance for somebody offering me money. Now, an offering to, to, to a pastor or an evangelist is wonderful. That's something you should do. But to pay somebody off to do something the way you want them to do it, man, that should never come into Christianity, ever. Come on, somebody say amen. I had one man try that with me when I first came to Birmingham. He tried me to compromise on something with his daughter and uh, because she had gotten herself in uh, a little bit of, I don't want to go too, too detailed, got herself in a little bit of trouble as far as her marriage went, and she was lying, and she was, and I knew the whole story, he did too, and he wanted me to kind of just forget about it when, when something happened, and I told him I wouldn't. And he asked me for his tithes back. I get, and he was very affluent. I gave him his tithes back for four years. The four years that I knew that he had paid tithes, I gave him back to him. It was a lot of money. You know why? Because a man of God cannot be bought. Somebody say amen. I don't even know why I told you that, but I thought I should. Listen, Daniel's reward, Daniel's refusal. Keep your cash, I could care less. No one who walked as close to God as Daniel did, did needed to be rewarded or bribed to deliver a message. He knew that he was there for that reason. There comes a time when we all have to make that decision. The things of God always outweigh the things of the world. Somebody say amen to that one. A scarlet robe, a gold chain, a third ruler, those things were worthless to a prophet who knew from the very beginning that Babylon's fate 
would be sealed by the Persians and by, their, by the Greeks. Listen to what Daniel knew. He knew, he already read the writing, by the way, when he sees it. He knows that Babylon's going to fall. He knows the first ones they're going to look for are the people with the robes, the gold, and the, and the cash. So he understands it. He knows exactly what's going on. He's not looking to get, not that that's deterring him, but he knows that this is only temporary. And even if they weren't looking for him, it's just temporary. It's going to be sealed by the Persians and eventually by the Greeks. The God of Israel has already written the word bankrupt, by the way, over all that Belshazzar had. And I want to imagine that people are starting to sober up by this point of the evening. Daniel has the floor and the people are all ears. And he does not pull any punches as he tells the king to keep his gifts. Nothing sobers up a drunk like a crisis. And they have a crisis going on. Nobody had spoken to Belshazzar like this before. He's directly into the king's face. Daniel is in no hurry to interpret the writing. The king's going to get some preaching first. As a matter of fact, what I'm about to read you, Daniel will not interpret the writing right off the bat. He'll start preaching to the king. I love this. Look at Daniel's rebuke. Daniel chapter 5, verse 18 to 23. He actually rebukes him. O thou king, the most high God, please take note to that word, the most high God. We're going to visit it in a moment. O thou king, most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Notice he says, it wasn't your father, God gave it to him, the most high God. And by the way, this is where we're going to center tonight. I'm going to get back here. There is something you and I need to hear tonight because you've understood something that Belshazzar did not understand. And this is extremely important. It's a reason for your, for your living and a reason for your being here. Gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And he goes on to say this. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would, sl whom he would slew and whom he, would be, he kept alive. In other words, he had the power of life and death. And whom he would set up and whom he would put down. But when his heart was lifted up, pride, and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Now, notice that word glory. Notice the words most high God. Notice the word glory. This is put there by the Holy Spirit. I never saw this until I started studying it this past week. And listen, I've read this many, many times. As we, uh, verse 21. It says, And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like beasts, and his dwelling was like the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven. So he knew that the Most High God, there it is again, ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. No one is in a position of authority today that God did not allow to be in a position of authority. First up is a history lesson. Daniel hammers home the name the Most High God. And then he goes for the conscience by telling a well-known story of the pride, madness, restoration, and confusion of Nebuchadnezzar. I want to stop here for a moment and tell you what Daniel's setting up and give you this, what I want to, what I want to lead you into tonight. Here's the names of God in the Old Testament. What is God's name in the Bible? And why does God seem to have so many names? He has so many names in the Old Testament. And I started to think about this, and I've known a little bit about this. I've done a lot of study on this. But I started to connect it to why Daniel, why, while Daniel is emphasizing the Most High God. And I wanted to just see it. First of all, the word El, the prefix El, is, uh, is something for God. Uh, actually, El this, like an Elvis Presley, El, I said this before to another study. El means to see. El, El means God. This is, is actually a Cajun word from French, which means to see. And so Elvis, was his mother named, his mother was Pentecostal. His mother named him as God sees. Aaron is his middle name. It means priestly. And uh, Presley actually means priestly. So she was feeling that her son could have, should have been an evangelist for God. Obviously, God showed her that. She actually said that. Uh, Elvis, had he used his talents in the, in the way God wanted him to use them, would probably be one of the greatest evangelists you and I had ever heard. So L is a prefix for God, like in Daniel, or a suffix, Daniel. Uh, L El God, mighty, strong, prominent. It's used over 250 times in the Old Testament. We have with El Shaddai, God Almighty, 48 times. Literally the powerful God who stands on top of the mountain. I love that one. El Elyon, I'll tell you about that one later. El Berith, Berith is a cutting of flesh. It means the God of the covenant. Judges tells us that. I'm not giving you all the scripture verses here. El Olam, I love this one. The God of the, the everlasting God, the God of the vanishing point. And I'll tell you about that one also a little later. The God of the vanishing point. El Gibor. The mighty God. Then there's another translation for God. Yahweh. It's the Tetragrammaton. Y-H-V-H. The sacred name, the unutterable name. Or modernly translated Jehovah. It means to be or to exist. The self-existent one. It occurs 6,823 times in the Old Testament. It means this. 
God always was, and he always will be. These are the big bang names for God. Before anything was, God was. He wants man to know that. 6,800 times he tells, over 6,800 times he tells him, before there was anything, I am. It's the great Jehovahistic title. Then it has Jehovah uh, Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, Genesis 22, 14. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. It's a military term, by the way. Uh, Jehovah Makadeshen, uh, the Lord your sanctifier, who makes you holy. Jehovah Roi, the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. Jehovah Elohim Israel, the Lord, the God of Israel. Jehovah Rophe, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Elohim, the Lord our God, plural form, by the way. Then there's other words for God. Abhir, which is mighty one. Kadosh, the holy one. Shaphat, judge. El Roy, the God who sees. Kana, the jealous God. Pale, the delivering God. Yesha, the Lord who saves. Gael, the Lord who redeems, which means buys back. Magan, the Lord our shield. By the way, the star of David is called the Magan David, the shield of David. Uh, Eliahuth, strength. Sadiq, the righteous one. Zur, the God our rock. That is actually used, that word is used when it talks about circumcision. Uh, Atik Yom, the ancient of days. Milek, the God our King, Adonai, God of Majesty, plural, like Elohim. And the name used in our text, El Elyon, the Most High God, it stresses God's strength, His sovereignty, and His supremacy. And it's all over Scripture. Listen, Genesis 14, 19. And He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham the, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Psalm 9, 2. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praises to thy name, O God Most High. Daniel 5.18, O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. Daniel uses it specifically. Verse 7, 18, but the saints of the most high shall take thy kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. That's you and I, saints of the most high God. We're the one, you remember the stone that was created out without hands in the mountain and his kingdom will last forever. You are a citizen of that king, of the most high God. Remember the most high God, what it means. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was given, Daniel 7, 22, to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. That's us, by the way. Daniel speaks in seven, chapter 7 of the kingdom to come. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. This is the Antichrist. Shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and a times and dividing of times. So what we're talking about is this Most High God. And I'm going to go back and revisit these names in a moment. I want you to just see them for a bit. And then we're going to tell you a little bit about them, a little bit more detail how it, refer, how it uh, refers to you and I. Then he goes for the conscience by telling a well-known story of the pride and of the madness and the restoration, the confession of Nebuchadnezzar. God waited patiently for Nebuchadnezzar to get off his high horse of pride. Most people mistake God's long-suffering for weakness. Uh, however, that's not the case. God is not willing that any should perish. God will wait, and he will ma wait out man. And if man's in pride and he seems like he's getting away with something, it seems like God's letting him get away from it, it's only for so long. Come on, somebody say amen. Look at verse 22 and 23. You still with me tonight? It's interesting, isn't it? And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart. Man, he's speaking straight to the king. Comes out of obscurity, an old man, and he is not afraid of a thing. I told you before, there are two types of people who don't care what they say. The ones who are very, very old, they could care less what they say. And those who almost die, they could care less either. But thou, listen, it says, And this his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. You knew how God rescued Nebuchadnezzar, and you still haven't humbled your heart. But have lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of this house before thee. And thou and thy lords, thy wives, thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and brass and iron and wood and stone, which see not, nor hear not. And the God who is in thy hand, thy breath is, God has your breath in his hands. And whose are all thy ways have you not glorified." Nebuchadnezzar showed his pride by boasting about his achievements. By the way, in Titus chapter 2, verse 8, it says, it says something pretty interesting. It says, sound speech, and it's pretty amazing, it says, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. This is the thing that brought Daniel in there. He had sound speech. There was no evil in his mouth. There's nothing that anybody could say against him. He, taught, he spoke the truth. Let me tell you something. People want the truth more than they want flattery. Somebody say amen. So it goes on. Look where I am. He says, uh, God, so God waits patient for Nebuchadnezzar to get off his high horse of pride. Most people, again, mistake God's long suffering for weakness. However, it's not the case. God will wait people out. Verses 22 and 23 
It says, now his son have not humbled thyself. Nebuchadnezzar showed his pride by boasting about his achievements and taking credit for what God had helped him accomplish. But his grandson displayed his pride by desecrating the holy vessels from the temple of the Most High God and treating the Lord with contempt. By using these vessels to praise the idols of Babylon, the king was guilty of both blasphemy and idolatry. By ignoring what he knew of Babylon's royal history, he displayed also his ignorance. Like Belshazzar and his guests, many people in our world today are unmindful of the lessons of the, pla of the past. They will rail words out against God. They will condemn God. They will tell him that he's not there. They'll speak all kinds of evil against him. They'll change Bibles to the Queen James Version. They could care less. Like God is just silent. He's never going to do anything about it. Listen, God will wait you out. He will wait mankind out. And they're unprepared for the consequences that lie in the future. Now, I don't believe that God's going to bring down his wrath immediately on everyone. But let me tell you something. You either bow to him or you bow because of him. Come on, somebody say amen. So Daniel's revelation comes, verse 24 and 25. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Mine, mine, tikel, ufarsin. You'll notice in your Bible, it's all capitalized. Now, all the kinds of comments have been made about the writing on the wall, and there are several viewpoints. Some say that the letters could have been written in one line, and some say it was written in block form. So it could either have been written like this, and by the way, it's Hebrew. It's read from the right to the left. Look at mine. 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 Tikel. Ufarsin. Do you everybody see it? If you see it, raise your hand. If you don't see it, raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand if you don't see it. It's okay. Watch. Mine. M-N-A. By the way, Hebrew has no vowels in it. An A and a U are not a vowel in Hebrew. You have to add the vowels, which means Hebrew is a language that's passed from mouth to ear. So you can't write the word in Hebrew unless you heard somebody say it. So Daniel has heard his ancestors say words. He knew Hebrew. He knew the vowels to put in. He knew the construction of it. No wonder why they couldn't interpret it. There's no vowels in it. And so they, not only is it not in, in their language, there's no vowels in it. Some people believe it could have been written this way also, if they did know it, in column form. Mine, mine, tikel, farsen. So we don't know exactly how, but somewhere, those are the letters that were written. Maybe this is the reason why the wise men couldn't read it. They, they read it the same as Hebrew, right to left, but in this case, it would have made no sense to them. Daniel would read from the, maybe the top to the bottom and putting in the vowels. Look at verses 26 and 28. 26 through 28. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mine, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikel. You are weighed in a balance and you're found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and is given to the Medes and the Persians. Some people believe the word Perez is a play on words. It actually is the same word for Persia. And so Daniel is saying, interprets the inscription, numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. Again, mine, the first word was repeated for emphasis and the fact that God had determined and established the end of his kingdom. If he could set it up, he could take it down. And he's telling him it's going to happen soon. The Babylonian Empire had run its course. Its number had come up. Tikel. Belshazzar himself was weighed and wanting. He had sinned willfully against God. Thou knewest all this, verse 22 says. Daniel tells him while he was preaching to him that Belshazzar has crossed the line with God and when he was put on God's scales to be weighed, he came up short. Perez. Why is this, the word Eupharsin now changed to Perez? Well, they both mean the same thing, divided. Eupharsin is present tense, Perez is past tense. So Daniel, watch this. He's reading, it's Eupharsin, but as he's saying it to Belshazzar, they're already conquering the city. So he uses Perez. He says, your kingdom is numbered. The, the, when it was written, it meant that, you, that you, were, you, were, you were gone, and now it's actually happened. One's present tense, and the other one is past tense. Also, a play on words, Perez, get it very close to the word Persia. Now, let me show you Daniel's robing as we continue on. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the rule, third ruler in the kingdom. I'm laughing because in his last gesture of defiance, the king gives Daniel the unwanted gifts. Maybe Belshazzar thought that these gifts would alleviate the situation. It's like the king was trying to put a plaster band-aid on a gunshot wound. There's no point, not much hope. It's, it's not his to give anymore. Daniel's not bothered with the gifts at all. He knows that there's no throne left for Belshazzar. Look at verse 30 and 31. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. He died that night. And Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old, 32 years old. Okay, so follow me now tonight. 
Belshazzar was slain that very night. Because of the high walls, the guard towers, and the bronze gates, the people in the city thought they were safe from the enemy, impregnable. But the media Persian army found a way in. This is history. Listen to it. Remember how we said the Euphrates River went straight through Babylon, all through Babylon, 14 miles through the city, by the way. History records that while the king feasted, the Persian army completed a channel that they had dug on the Euphrates River. They dug it for three nights with thousands of soldiers. That night, they dammed the main river course, diverting the river to its new channel. Persian soldiers marched under the city walls on dry ground on the Euphrates River bed in mass and destroyed the entire city. Listen, the silver chest reigns. Look at verse 31. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Cyrus, king of Persia, kept most of Babylon, but gave it Persian to be ruled by Darius the Mede. Who then is Darius the Mede? Again, secular history books and encyclopedias jump all over this. They, they say that there's no such ruler. The tradition of Darius as lord is the same title as Caesar or Pharaoh. Cyrus had put one of his commanding officers in charge of the province of Babylon. So you read about Cyrus, who's the main king, Darius also. Look at the importance of the chest of silver. Remember the chest of silver? How many remember it? Head of gold, chest of silver will come. Daniel prophesied this. He's seeing his prophecy fulfilled. Listen to this chest of silver. And you, I just want you to see, I'm going to bring in a little bit more of uh, prophecy for you tonight so you can see what's going on here. I'm going to turn back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 18 through 27. And I want you to see this chest of silver, what it means. And the sons of Noah that went forth from the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. By the way, if you're, if you're uh, Afro-American or black tonight, you are, a, you are a descendant of Ham. If you are a Jew tonight, you are a descendant of Shem. If you are a, a Gentile tonight from Europe, European descent, you're a, you're a descendant of Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Canaan settled G, uh, uh, Israel and what we know is Africa. These are the three sons of Noah. And of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be a husband, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and was drunken and was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren outside. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward. It's considered a sin to see your father naked, by the way. And covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son, Ham, had done. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall be to his brethren. I've heard preachers preach that, that black people are cursed because of this, and that's why they're black. That is hogwash. It is absolute hogwash, prejudice hogwash. has nothing to do with that. It has to do with this. And he said, Blessed be the Lord of God of Shem, Shem Shemites, Semites, Jews, and Cana shall be a servant. Remember, the Jews defeated Cana. Come on, are you with me? God shall enlarge Japheth. Japheth shall grow. The Gentiles shall grow. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So the Gentiles, this is the massive prophecy, the Gentiles shall grow. Now watch. Look at the importance of this chest of silver. Noah made a remarkable prophecy regarding his sons. He passed over his second son, Ham, in silence because of the misbehavior. He prophetically cursed Ham's son, Cana, because he would be the father of the foul and wicked Canaanite nations who so filled and defiled the promised land. That's what they did. He blessed his youngest son, Shem, from him would come the Semitic people, Jews, particularly Abraham, and above all, the Lord Jesus himself. Finally, he blesses his oldest son, Japheth. To him he promises enlargement, political dominion, and a prominent place in the tents of Shem. Satan immediately set about the task of proving Noah to be a false prophet. The first great empires were Hamitic and Semitic. I told you about the head of gold. Those were Hamitic and Semitic. They were from Ham and from Shem. The Egyptian empire was Hamitic. The Assyrian and the Babylonian empires were both Semitic. But with the death of Belshazzar, world empires passed from the hands of J to the hands of Japheth. All the next world leaders will be Gentiles. Matter of fact, from there, Japheth will rule all the way down to Antichrist. And so we see that this is a massive prophecy being taken, taking effect at the death of Belshazzar. Uh, Antichrist, by the way, will remain there in the hands of Belshazzar. Japheth, his descendants, until Antichrist comes to revive the old Roman Empire to rule the world and be swept away by the returning Christ. Some scholars believe, and I do, that the Antichrist will try to bring back a Semitic world empire. He will claim to be a Jew. And so it's very, very interesting what we're seeing here. So what do we learn from all this? Well, let me skip a little bit more for you. 
and tell you what that great thing I wanted to tell you. How many of you know who this man is? If you know who this man is, I'm sitting down and you can teach the rest of this. This is Xenophron. He's a Greek historian, historian from the fourth century in Athens, a secular historian. He writes, the mighty city of Babylon was then taken during a night festival and the king was slain. There is no word either in history or in the scriptures that Belshazzar ever sought repentance. It was too late. Daniel expresses even more strikingly, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1. He that being often reproved hardens his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Proverbs 29, 26. Many seek the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment comes from the Lord. That means a lot of people kiss up to people who are powerful, but judgment comes from the Lord. Proverbs 1, 22, 26. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not all my counsel and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your command and calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. God's going to have final say. But I want to show you something. So it was with Belshazzar. He learned the hard way that God is, in, is the most high God. Let's go back here for a moment as I really bring you to what I want to tell you tonight. One of the Old Testament names for God. Why? So why so many names for God in the Old Testament? Now listen real well. Because God's function, His character, is all man will ever need in life. All you'll ever need in life is to find out the character of God. The more you find out the character of God, now listen to the rest of my words well, because it's, they're golden, trust me. Not because of me, but because of the word. Once you find out the character of God in every aspect of your life, you will actually start to know the reason why you're here and the meaning for life. We find in his name everything we could emotionally and spiritually and physically hope for. Now, don't miss what I'm about to tell you next. You see, the great purpose of man, the reason we are all created, is to glorify God, period. The reason God made you and me and seven billion people on this planet is for one reason and one reason only. It's not to build cities. It's not to get big, big houses. It's not to get low, low houses. It's not to have a lot in your 401k. It's not to be a pauper. The whole reason you are here, you can't give me any other reason, is to give glory to God. That's the only reason mankind is on the planet. The only reason we are here, every man, Barack Obama, me, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, every single man that's ever, and woman that's ever been created was for one reason, and it's to give glory to God. As a matter of fact, I don't want you to miss this. This is in everything you do. Look at this. Whether you, therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, what does that mean? What exactly does it mean? And what about all these names? And essential to our ability to glorify God is the knowledge of God. You cannot glorify God unless you know who he is in every aspect of your life. I'm going slow because you've got to get this tonight. And knowing him personally in view of that knowledge. Now... This is good, so follow me. It's a revelation. The word glory in the Greek New Testament, and even in here, is the word in the Greek, it's the word doxo. And it means this. You've heard of doxology. Glory means this, opinion or estimation. And here's where it gets really good. Like this. What's your opinion of the weather out there today? How many of you know some of you have different opinions? How many of you know some of you think, man, it's too cold, I hate the cold. And others are saying, man, I love this weather. How many are with me? Don't miss me tonight. This is probably one of the most powerful things you're ever going to hear, I promise you. And I don't say that a lot. What's your opinion of Bible study? Oh, I like it, but I don't like it in the news. Oh, I like it all. I like it in the news and this. What's your opinion of the State of the Union that America's in? Some people out in America may say, I love this. I love this new president. Others may say, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to us. The word doxo means your opinion or your estimation. Now watch. We are told to give our doxo to God so that he can get our glory, our glory to God. The glory needs to go to God. Our opinion needs to go to, of him, our estimation of him. Listen, enter the names. Again, let me show you this chart and show you the names so you can follow with me tonight. Names of God. And I'll go, I'm not going to give you all the chart. I'm just going to read some of the names to you and tell you. Listen to this. Is he your El Elyon? It means mightier than your problems. That's what El Elyon means. Is he mightier than problems? Or when your problems come up, is your opinion 
that this is terrible. Nothing can help you out of this. How many are with me? Are you with me tonight? Now watch. Is he your El Olam? El Olam is the, is, means vanishing point. If you're an artist, is there any artist, are there any artists in here tonight? If you're an artist and you paint or you draw, in order to show perspective or distance, you take two points, on, you take a point here and a point here, and then you draw them out to the horizon, and you will have perspective. It means you'll see distance and you'll see time, future or past. This is perspective. That's, that's in front of you. This shows those two parallel lines all the way down the that uh, go to the distance, that's perspective. So the word El Olam means the vanishing point. This is called the vanishing point. Your mind takes you, you know there's a road past that, but you can't see it. Is God your vanishing point? That's what the, you ha if, you, if you are built for the glory of God, your opinion of him matters because the more you have a favorable opinion in his names, knowing who he is, then the more you're going to give glory to him and the more you're fulfilling your purpose in life. So if you can't see down the road, man, I'm going to start preaching. If you can't see down the road and you know that there's something there and you're confused about it and you trust God, your opinion of God is he's going to take care of you down the road because he's the El Olam. He's the God of the vanishing point. So even though you don't understand something, down there, your opinion of God is he's going to take care of it because he's already down there. How many are with me tonight? This is what we're talking. You see him beyond your troubles. When life gets foggy beyond, beyond the place where you can't see him, is he still your El Olam? Is he still the vanishing point? You still know that there's a, that there's a credibility because he's out there and he's down there. You know what? We say we trust God. We say we love God. And I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about a lot of people. But then when a problem comes up, we get confused. We say we don't understand the, God, the El Olam. We're where is God? We ask, where is God? What we're actually doing is we're saying our opinion of God is he's not really down there. And you give no glory to God. But when you give glory to God, you say, I don't understand what's going on in my life. I don't understand the cancer I got. I don't understand why my finances are bad. But I'm going to trust God because he's the God I can't see that's going to take me all the way down the road. This is the El Olam. And when you do that, you give glory to God and you fulfill your purpose in life. And God, trust me, God's going to elevate you because you are living up to the purpose God has for you. Are you with me tonight? This is why, wait, this is why Belshazzar finds his way into God's word. Because he never glorifies God. He glorifies himself. Listen, listen to what's happening. We are seeing something here that's pretty powerful. We are seeing something here that is a life message for every human being you could possibly imagine. I want you to understand what's going on in this, in this juncture. What's happening is something that is really kind of amazing to me. It's something that really is, is something beyond anything that you could possibly imagine. What we're seeing here is we're seeing something that is, uh, that is a life message for every human being that lives on planet Earth. I want to give you some of these names and show you what some of them mean. Listen, El El Elyon, the Most High God, the God of sovereignty, the God of uh, the God of strength and supremacy. So, when something happens and you feel very weak and you say, "I can't make it anymore," what you're actually saying is, "I don't have an opinion that God's sovereign." Now, watch, El Elyon, the Most High God, El Olam, the Everlasting God, as I've told you about, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. I don't know what I'm going to do, Pastor. Everything's happening to me. It seems like I'm going to go down. Uh, nothing ever happens good to me. You know what you're saying? Your opinion of God is he's not going to help you. You just erase Jehovah Jireh out of your life. But in the meantime, if you say, if you say man, I believe. I'm, I'm in tough shape right now. I'm doing the best I could. But I believe God's going to take care of me. Now you're giving glory to God. Your opinion is I believe in Jehovah Jireh. The reason why God's many names are there is so that you can learn another characteristic of God. You can trust him and you can fulfill your purpose in life by lifting up that name and knowing him for that reason. If Cheryl came to me and said, Mark, you're such a, you're such a sweet guy. I'd say, well, thank you. That's your opinion of me. But if she comes into me every day and she says, finds something new about me, says, Mark, you know, you're so loving. Man, thank you. Man, Mark, you're so giving. She's seeing me and she's recognizing it. She's giving her opinion to me. This is what God wants from us. He wants in our troubles. Why do you think when somebody gets a divorce and they feel all alone, there's a word for God that talks about him being alone. Jehovah Shammah. Everybody has left you, but God is there. You feel his presence. Man, you're giving him glory because everybody else has left you, but Jehovah Shammah is still there and you're giving glory to God and you're fulfilling your purpose. So it answers a couple questions tonight. Why do bad things happen to good people? So you can find the name of God that applies to that bad thing. Give him glory and fulfill your purpose in life. Because your purpose in life is to give glory to God. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. It means he protects you. He fights for you. 
Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is my peace. Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, a military figure, portraying the Lord as the commander of the Lord's armies. You think you have to fight your own battles? You don't have to fight your own battles. You, all you have to do is believe in, in Jehovah Sabaoth. Jehovah Makadeshem, your Lord, your sanctifier. That means when you feel guilty about your sins, even though you've asked Jesus to forgive them of your sins, and then you still feel guilty, you are not acknowledging God. You are saying, my opinion is that you can't forgive me. How many are with me tonight? Jehovah Roy, the Lord is my shepherd, portrays the Lord as a shepherd who cares for his people, as a shepherd who cares for his sheep, is not going to let anything happen to you. Jehovah Sh Shammah, the Lord is there. Jehovah Rophe, the Lord who heals. Listen, I found out who Jehovah Rophe is. I preached about him all my life. I found out who he was in a hospital room in MD Anderson when they told me you have seven months to live back here. I found out Jehovah Rapha who he really was. I, my opinion was, no matter what the doctors do, God, you're going to heal me. I gave him glory. I, you know, and I didn't even know it, but for, I said, God, don't heal me for my family. Don't heal me for Cheryl. Don't heal me for the, the ministry. Heal me for your glory. And you know what? He healed me for his glory. Now watch. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. From Sidek, it means to be scales, full weight, justice, righteousness. It means no matter what the enemy tries to hold against you, God weighs his son on this side of the scale, and you are found righteous. Amen. Jehovah Kadosh, the Holy One. Jehovah Elroy, the God of seeing. That's given to Hagar, by the way, in the wilderness, when everybody abandoned her, even Abraham. And God saw her. Listen, everybody on your life, in your life, can up and leave you. You can feel like the worst person on the planet, but God will always see you. He will always be your Jehovah Elroy. Pale, the deliverer. Gael, redeemer, means to buy you back. Magan, shield, God will protect you. Eleoth, strength. El Bereth, the God of the covenant. It's used, used in Judges. El Gibor, the mighty God. Is there anything too hard for God? Absolutely nothing. Zur, God our rock. Then in the New Testament, you have Theos, which is the only true God. There is no other. Kurios means Lord, supre supremacy and authority. Despotos, which is master and ownership. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. And then he calls, gives us another name, only in the New Testament, Father. So when every else abandons you and everybody else leaves you, that you still know God your Father. Right, Stanley? Right, right for me. Mark Carell, that's the thing that brought me to God. My father died and abandoned me. And when I found out that God could be my father, it humbled me. And you know what? Not knowing it, I gave him glory because I accept him as my father. Now, tonight, I want you to see something. Every man will be who ignores God and the many facets of his character that have found in his name judged. Every man. Belshazzar shows us he's there not because of Belshazzar. I mean, history has forgotten him. Why does God remember him? So it's a proof to man that, man, you, you have a short time to live. Give glory to God. I'm so thankful for this Bible study and for you because you even, you even showing up tonight shows that you want to give glory to God. You want to hear about his word. His word he esteems even above his name. So in being here, you give glory to him. The more we live our life, the more God we need. Let me say that again. The more we live our life, the more God we need. There are some of those names I haven't experienced yet. There's some you haven't experienced yet. 6,823 times, one name alone. 11,000 names is God's name. 11,000 times is God's name found in Scripture. It's his revelation of who he is so that we could tap in and find him in those moments when we need strength, help, protection, a shield, forgiveness, all those names of his character. So that, and as you find him in those he receives glory and you fulfill your calling and what you're supposed to do. The more glory he gets, the more of our opinion favorably we give him. That is, there is none higher, none greater, none stronger, none more loving, none more caring, none anything. He is the most high God. It means he stands on the mountain and nothing can compare to him. And the more you put him up as the most high God, the more glory you give him. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Man, I liked this Bible study. The title of this chapter 5 was, I am God and I approve this message. <laughs> Psalm 90, verse 9. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. I don't want to leave you with a down note, but I want to leave you with an up note, and I want to tell you this. In Scripture, 
our life is not compared to something that's very, very long. No matter how long we live, it's talked about as a tale, short tale it's told. Talked about a weaver's beam, I've told you this before. It's talked about a blade of grass that's up in the morning, down by night. It's talked about as a, a mist, an early morning mist that rises and is gone. Why do we think we're going to live here forever? We're not. It's not going to happen. But we are going to live somewhere forever. And I have a feeling our rewards are going to be based on how much we recognize the names of God and give Him glory. I think the ones who lift Him up the most, He is going to lift up the most. So right now, everything you do, everything we, it tells us in Corinthians, everything you, everything you say, everything you do, everything in your eat, every time you eat, you lie down, give Him glory. Thank you, God. My opinion of you is great. I don't know why I get so incensed, and I know it's from our own, he knows our human weaknesses, but when people say to me, I don't understand God, I'm mad at God, man, that's totally opposite of, of giving God glory. It's totally opposite. You're, and I understand the plights that bring people in. I'm not condemning anyone for that. But now that you know this, maybe we'll never say that again. Maybe we'll say, God, I don't understand what's going on with me, but you do. You're the God of strength. You're the God of wisdom. You're the God of might. You're the God of glory. You're the most high God. Man, I believe that we've done a great service for our king tonight just by telling you this. And I entrust you, and so does he, with the knowledge that you've received tonight. So tonight I'm going to ask us all just to stand. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to give glory to God by standing and giving a, a clap offering tonight. Just a, a round of, of applause to God. Had Belshazzar, had Belshazzar taken out one moment in that, in that festival and did this for God, he would never have died that night. He would have defeated the Persian and, and the Medes, and God would have turned around his kingdom. Who knows what God's going to do for you this next week? Who knows what he's going to open up for you and how he's, going to, how he's going to manifest himself in your life because you have taken time to give him glory. Listen, I know we're all Christians, and if you're not tonight, see me before you get out of here. But it's okay Every now and then, as a matter of fact, it's okay more than every now and then to give God glory. You can never outgive God. You give him what he wants, trust me, he will give you the desires of your heart. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight for who you are. I thank you for this revelation knowledge, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that even though we give you glory and we say it, now we know what it means. We know that our opinion of you is really what matters to you. You, you created us so we could have a favorable opinion of you and in so doing, give you glory. In response to that glory, Lord, you protect us. You give us the fulfillment of your character through your names, our strength. You give us righteousness, Lord God. You lift us up, a shield. Lord, you give us all of your names. They're passed back down to us. So tonight I'm thankful for these people here tonight that have given you glory, Lord. Continue to be with them as this new year comes, Lord. And in everything we say and do, may we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you.